Are you ready for the entertainment experience of a lifetime? Knock down, drag out, hard hitting conversations, debates, and interviews. Well, have you said yes to any of these questions? Sit back, relax, and enjoy something like no other. This is the Isolation Series Podcast, presented by the Scott Robles team at Douglas Elliman Real Estate, by WellBeingsPerformance.com for all your online meeting needs, by Barbarian Steakhouse, Canada's premier upscale restaurant. For more information, go to Barbarians.com, by ImprintPilates.com Toronto and the Greater Toronto Area's premier Pilates studio, and by the Toronto Immune and Digestive Health Institute. For more information, go to tidhi.ca. Here now is your host, Spencer Miller. Hey guys, and welcome to this Tuesday edition of the Isolation Series. Me, Spencer Miller, very pleased to be joined by a very dear friend of mine and my guest today, actor extraordinaire, the one the only Dylan Taylor. Dylan, welcome to the Isolation Series for the very first time, my friend. Thank you, Spence. We've been uh, we've been talking about this for a long time, so I'm glad we finally got it sorted. Absolutely. Let's uh, jump right in. I wanted to get your thoughts first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are now 22 months into a pandemic, and uh, our um, industry of entertainment has been hit hard, like a lot of other industries have as well. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to still continue to work in some respects, and you have as well on a few different projects. Uh, but what are your thoughts overall on the state of the entertainment industry right now? Because I'm fearful that we are still about, you know, a year and a half to two years away from being fully past this whole pandemic thing still. Um, and that is a lot longer than we initially anticipated back in March of 2020 when we saw Rudy Gobert do the whole thing during the press conference and this whole thing started. Um, what are your thoughts as we sit here almost two years into it? Well, I, I think that we're, we're actually fortunate in a sense in our industry because we, we are in a very adaptive industry. Uh, we're this traveling circus that is constantly, you know, dealing with, with you know, new and different obstacles and changing circumstances, you know. Um, so, you know, it's been my experience the last year and a half since I've been back to work that they've just sort of, you know, we've added a COVID department and the protocols have been have been rigorous and they've been working. And so in that sense, I feel like as opposed to, say, you know, a building that has, you know, a set amount of entrances and exits and, and, and uh, confined spaces and stuff like that. It's much harder for them to sort of get back to any sort of sense of, of a new normal or whatever for their industry. Um, definitely, it's harder for lower budget things right now to, to, to find a home and to find a place, you know, um, everything I've worked on this past year has been, have, have all been pretty big budget things because they're the ones that can afford to be working um, and they can afford, you know, the, the COVID protocols and stuff like that. So unfortunately, I think the independent scene is the one that's really suffering the most in our industry. And yeah, I, I, I do think that we're, um, you know, a solid year or plus away from, from um, it being, you know, the COVID protocols being affordable or being reduced to an amount that, you know, indie productions can sort of start to thrive again. But, you know, I think there's a lot of other industries out there that are suffering a lot more than ours. I look at the restaurant industry and, and the live theater industry, you know, my, my family and I have a lot of background in, in live entertainment and in theater and stuff. And they're the ones that I think are really suffering the most as far as film and television. Yeah. We've taken a hit like the whole world has, but I think that we're lucky that we have such a, uh, uh, resourceful people in our industry and people that really are used to problem solving, you know, on a regular basis. Right. Um, do you think that any of these uh, big budget productions have taken a hit in terms of uh, what they have overall wanted to do with their end product because of having to adapt due to the pandemic or not really? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there's been a lot of, um, sort of sacrifices made behind closed doors or, I mean, I just finished, uh, 
I was working on Station Eleven for months, which is out now on on HBO Max. And they, you know, they started shooting in Chicago before the pandemic happened, and you know, picked up production six months later in in Toronto, Canada, in, in a completely different, you know, country. And I'm sure there was a lot of conversations about, you know, and sort of pseudo sacrifices made to to make it work. But, you know, I mean, like I said, it's it's um, it's an industry that's used to to dealing with change and and you know, for any production to even become a production, it has to overcome so many you know hurdles. It's almost a miracle to get anything into production. So, you know, um, yeah, you know. It's our, it's our industry. Well, what are your thoughts on the fact that in recent weeks in Toronto and in Canada for, for the large part, uh, they've gone back to no fans of sporting events or concerts or anything like that, where on the other flip side of the coin, you look at the United States and they had uh, the national championship college football game last night in Indianapolis with about 75,000 of their closest friends on watching Georgia and Alabama go toe to toe with each other. Um, so, so I know that there still is a giant divide yeah. in that process, even two years into this. Um, but uh, do you think that Ontario and Canada needs to reassess at all and, uh, and think, about going back to limited capacities as opposed to no fans? Or are you in agreement right now with the no fan situation? You, you know, um, in, in all fairness, Spence, I, I don't consider myself qualified to, uh, to answer that question. You know, I, I don't really know the full, you know, burden that's placed on, on our medical professionals and on the hospitals and stuff like that. You know, I had, uh, you know, and there's all kinds of talk about the strength of this variant and, uh, you know, the Omicron or, or I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing it right now. Um, but that, that, that variant, I mean, my, my grandmother, my 97 year old grandmother had it. And she went into the hospital and didn't go on a respirator and, and, and came out, you know, she was in there for a few days and, and came out and is at home and, and is, and is well. So, you know, it's, but then, you know, there's still people that, uh, you know, aren't going to be that lucky or going to get a stronger variant or have compromised immune systems or are just aren't going to get lucky, you know? So I, I'm not, I'm not qualified to answer that question. I, I, and I don't know what's right or what's wrong. I mean, going back to our industry, it's, I think it's something that we've, a hit we've taken this in the fall and, and coming into the winter right now. I think we lost out on a lot of productions that would have come here, um, because of our, our restrictions and stuff like that. And because it's easier to, you know, to, to, to do some, to, I think, call for production in the U.S. right now, I think is a lot easier. I don't think you have as much protocol to, to adhere to as, as we do uh, here. So I, I don't know the answer for that. You know, um, I try and stay in my lane a little bit, you know, and uh, I'd like to see fans back. I mean, I haven't had my kids, you know, at a, at a Raptors game in two years, which, you know, is something we always love to do. And we got out to a couple of Jays games this year and they were over the moon about it. And I just know how, how great that is, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that that's that my kids and I go into uh, some games is as important as, you know, health of the general population because it's just not. So I don't Absolutely. know. What are your thoughts on that Spence? What do you think? You want to see people back in there or, or, or you think they should be doing it right now? Oh, I think, I think there needs to be like a happy medium, like I said, in terms of the fact that I don't agree with packing the stadium full, yeah. but, but even if we went to like 20% capacity or, or something like that, yeah, it's not great, but at least you can get some frontline workers uh, back in there and, and, you know, doctors and different things like that, again, to say thank you, because as we know, this is a very transmissible wave that we are currently experiencing right now so i i figured it'd be a nice you know gesture and a nice break for those people especially uh, if they could go to the games yeah I, I i i think that would be an ideal situation um 
but I mean, I don't know. I'm hoping my kids are back in school next week. Like that they're, they're saying they're going to be. So maybe if, if the kids are back in school, maybe we'll start to see, you know, in Toronto and Canada, some more of a reduced capacity um, events. Here we are a week and a half into 2022 and we've already been hit um, multiple times with legends leaving us a couple of days ago, subtly um, Bob Saget, great comedian and actor from Full House and How I Met Your Mother and America's Funniest Home Videos and one of the bluest comics in the history of uh, uh, comedy uh, passed away. And then on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, we had the legendary Betty White uh, pass away and, and Sidney Poitier um, and the great John Madden as well. Um, do you have any thoughts on anybody uh, out of those three specifically that I mentioned, Betty White, Sidney Poitier, or Bob Saget, uh, that really is a glaring memory for you in your early days of liking entertainment? Because I know uh, that I did, whether it be Golden Girls or Full House or whatever the case may be, uh, does anything stick out to you that sort of pushed you even more in the direction of thinking, hey, man, when I get older, I do want to do this. Yeah, I mean, you know, Cindy Poitier was always this like gold standard for for dramatic actors and and somebody who, you know, was just this this name, you know, like Bogart Poitier Poitier, like it was just like, uh, you know, a legend, right? So whenever a legend passes, you know, you always feel like there's been a marked, you know a change in the world. And I think that's very much the same with Betty White. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, I grew up on Betty White and Golden Girls and thought she was just, you know, one of the funniest people on television, uh, you know, ever for the last, I don't know what it was, six decades or something of television. And uh, she gave us so many memorable quotes and, you know, and it was funny. I, I remember reading, you know, a, a tweet a month ago or something like that saying like, you know, Betty White turns 100, and I guess she was supposed to turn 100 in the last few days or, or in next coming. In a week, yes. And uh, somebody was just saying, it was like 2021, please just see Betty White through. And, you know, for, for her to pass on New Year's Eve of 2021 at 99, I mean, that's the ultimate, you know, French exit. I mean, it's it's so befitting her in a sense. And, and yeah, and, and Bob Saget, I mean, that's still shocking. I don't know the details of his passing. Um, and I, I never met him personally, but I have a lot of friends who, who knew him well and, and, and met him on several occasions. And I, I never heard a, a bad word spoken about the guy in all honesty. Um, he seemed to always be somebody who made time for people. A lot of my friends were comedians and stuff, and he was still very much involved with, you know, with the, the grind of, of uh, the comedians, you know, sort of live on. And, uh, um, yeah, he, uh, I don't know. I hope, I hope he was, I hope he was, uh, passed in, in a way that wasn't, you know, uncomfortable or sad in any way, you know? Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, and why would you, cause this is the first time that Dylan's been on the isolation series, but, uh, Dylan's family has a long history with, uh, music and specifically, uh, music in Toronto. They had a lot to do with the Toronto, uh, TD Jazz Festival for a number of years. I know that your dad, I believe, started the festival in Toronto way back in the day. Um, and music is another industry that has a whole bunch of question marks around it right now as well. Uh, um, we saw that when the numbers were getting nicer and, and things seemed to be getting more back to normal before Omicron hit, uh, we saw big acts like John Mayer and the Red Hot Chili Peppers and on and on and on down the list start bringing their dates back to Toronto for the springtime and things like that. Do you think it's still a realistic expectation to uh, see big acts return in the spring slash summer or it's all dependent on what's going on? No, I, I think they'll be back. I think once we can return to outdoor events, I think things will open up again quite a bit. The city, we're we're a music city. We're, we've been we've always been known as a, as a music city, and um, you know, come May, we're gonna be we'll be the outdoor concerts. You know, I'm sure all the outdoor venues and stuff like that will be will be 
pumping and and who knows maybe even the acc and stuff like that will start doing smaller venues but uh yeah you know uh, i've talked to my dad about it and you know just i i i don't know he doesn't know what would have, how he would have done the jazz festival during this stuff i mean they've done obviously a smaller festival the last couple of years but it would have just been a, a nightmare and devastating especially the the way the festival used to operate and stuff like that the amount of club shows and stuff there used to be and uh yeah it's uh and like i said you know i still have lots of family live theater so i i really hope that we can uh you know that maybe the vaccines the boosters start to work and we start to you know get a handle on these variants and that we can get back to you know live music capacity you know full capacity or at least close to full capacity by the spring and i, I do think that'll happen i think it'll be mostly outdoor stuff but i don't know i'm confident you've been very fortunate uh throughout your career to have uh, some memorable characters uh, that you have played, but arguably one of your most memorable so far had to have been your recurring character on the uh, USA Network uh, show, Covert Affairs, uh, with Piper Parabo uh, a number of years ago. Uh, how did that uh, sort of end up maintaining being in your uh, wheelhouse for as long as it did? Because I don't know if they initially uh, said to you, hey, this is a one-time deal, and then you did such a good job with what you were given that they wanted to bring you back and it ended up carrying through the rest of the series or, or what have you, but it seemed to be quite a fun cast to be a part of and quite a good show to be a part of. Yeah, it, uh, well, I'll tell you exactly how it came about, which is pretty interesting. Um, I did a show called Defying Gravity uh, for ABC, which was a, a big budget show. We only did one season. It was created by Jim Perriott and Jim Perriott was, and Michael Edelstein. And these were two guys that were involved in the creation of uh, Grey's Anatomy and Desperate Housewives. And it was supposed to be this, this big show. And two of the writers on it were um, Meredith Lavender and Marcy Ulin. And um, the show got canceled after a season. It was shot in Vancouver. And I moved back to Toronto. And the next year I got a call uh, Mer uh, Meredith and Marcy were in Toronto working on COVID affairs and they called me to come uh, to go up for a drink one night. So I went and I met them with one of the other writers, uh, Matthew Lau, I think was his name. And uh, we had drinks one night and this guy, Matt Lau was saying, he was like, he loved my character on Defying Gravity. It was Steve Wassenfelder, who was a theoretical physicist and uh, but kind of a quirky astronaut, but he was a genius. And he just said, he loved my character. And they said they were going to write me something on the show. So a month or two later, I got uh, a call from Jim Perriott, or I got I got an audition. And I was like, oh, they're going to make me read for it. But it's different showrunners and stuff. And, you know, the, the, it was Matt uh, Gorman. And uh, anyways, I didn't know the showrunners. Jim Perriott was the creators. Jim Perriott was run, show running one season of it, the first season. So the, the creators wanted me to audition. And uh, I, was kind of, I was like, well, I thought they'd sort of written this part for me. But anyways, so I did the audition and I thought I was terrible. And uh, I really thought, and I, and I don't often think that, you know, I pretty, I, I feel like I have a benchmark. They don't really sag beneath it. I never really feel like I give a terrible audition. Sometimes just not what I want to do. But uh, I thought that one was particularly bad. And I went back and I wrote Jim and I was like, sorry, buddy, you know? Uh, and I was like, I know you guys were trying to give me this part, but like, I just, I just sucked. So I'm sure you can give it to somebody else, no hard feelings. And he wrote me back saying, you got the part. And I was like, oh, cool. And it was supposed to just be a guest star. And, uh, but I did have a relationship with them and they had talked about, they were like, we, we want to bring you back. We'll, we'll bring, uh, we'll bring Eric Barber back in some capacity. And then this, I don't know if you know this, Spence, but you'll like this little scoop. I was supposed to return for the season one finale. And I don't know if you know what happened to Piper in that season one finale when they were filming it. Have you ever heard what happened? No. A stunt man fell on her and snapped her leg. And oh, uh, man. yeah, and broke her leg, horrible break. He, she was supposed to be running through these sea containers and a dead body was supposed to drop and land right in front of her. And the stunt guy landed right on her and, and broke her leg. So the season one finale got pushed to a season two um, season opener. And at that time, so they called me and they're like, dates aren't happening. We'll push. We're going to do the episode as the opener for the next season. Piper has to heal up for the next four months, you know? So I said, okay, cool. 
I was in LA when they started shooting the first season, the second season. And they called me, they go, okay, here are your dates. And I said, well, I'm in LA, you're gonna have to fly me in. And they said, no, we're not gonna fly you in. And we have, because for their budgeting and stuff like that, they had me booked as a local for working local. And I, and I think it was only one day of work in that episode. And they're like, we're not gonna fly you in for one day. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not flying myself. And so I didn't do the part. They they gave the the handful of lines to just some other, I think they pared down the scene and gave the lines to some other sort of like tech guy. And I believe it was Michael Terrado who got, who ended up coming around a little bit more, but they gave the lines to him. And I thought, and then that season, the second season, Jim Perry had left, Marcy had left and Meredith had left. So I thought Barbara's done. And uh, then I think it was about the seventh or eighth episode in the second season, I got a call saying, hey, we want to have a bar, there's a barber scene we want to have you come and do. So I was like, okay, cool. So I got to come in, like, I got to make this memorable somehow. And so I just went in and I made some big choices and uh, it, you know, I finished off that season. I think I did two episodes in the second season. And then in the third season, um, uh, we had a new uh, showrunner, Stephen K came in in third season and Piper and I and Chris and I got along really well. And Stephen K ended up marrying Piper Parable and they obviously had a good rapport and they were talking about taking the show in a different direction and making it a bit darker and doing a bit more stuff with it. And part of that vision was, was Eric Barber getting brought in. Stephen K had liked the character from the first two seasons. And then I think in that third season, I did like 12 of the 15 episodes or 10 of the 12 or something like that. And it was awesome. They had this whole storyline with, I became Piper's handler and Augie was out and it was just, it was great rapport. And then for, after he was established so well in that season, he just sort of hung around, but it was a funny, you know, it looked like a shoe in and then it looked like a shoe out. And it was, it was just, uh, you know, and then it ended up being, I think 30 episodes or something over the course of the, the five years. So I was always very thankful to, to, you know, when I got to come in and be a guest star on that show. Was it a choice by you or was it a choice by them to have the character of Eric Barber seemingly always eating around technical stuff? Yeah, well, that was that was uh, the gag in the first episode that was written by them was that, uh, you know, um, Barber had to share his office with me for a period of time. And and as a blind man, he was always very specific about the location of of his chair even and yeah, and, and you mean you mean Augie, not Barbara. You're Barbara. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Augie had to be very specific about his workspace because he was blind. So placement chair. So that was originally the gag is that I, you know, put uh, food all over his workplace. And then I think what it, actually I could be, I believe we started. Then we started building on the gag. And I think the first episode that they had me back in in second season, I requested a, a sandwich. Uh, for this phone call. It was just sort of a straight phone call. And then I just spoke to wardrobe and I was like, I, I want to have the sandwich and be trying to get mustard off my shirt throughout the whole phone yeah. call. And I think that became a big barber moment that sort of carried on. And uh, and then I also, there was one episode, I think, I can't remember if it was that gag. And then I think later on in that season, I, I, I tweaked some lines so that I was a lot more flirtatious with uh, Piper, which they all got a kick out of because Barbara was this sort of, you know, chubby nerd and she was so far out of his league, but you know, shooter shoot, right? <laughs> so, and Barbara was a shooter if, if not anything, right? Shooter, shooter McGavin. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, we'll get you out of here on these two things. First, I'm going to throw it over to my co-host and partner, Paul Shields, because anytime that we have a guest for the first time, I know he loves to jump in and ask yeah. a good question. So, Paul, over to you. Thanks, Spence. And uh, thanks again, Dylan, for joining us. Um, recently, you were in the um, newest Resident Evil um, production. And I'm just curious, sort of, uh, what's it like to sort of jump on the moving train of a long-standing franchise like that? Like, any stories about fan bases or anything about that production that stands out to you? Yeah, I mean, the, the cool thing about that production was that it, it is a reboot, right? It's a complete reboot of the original franchise. And uh, I hadn't, I wasn't very familiar with the original, uh, with the movie franchise, but I was actually very familiar with the 1998 Capcom game, which uh, the, the the new Resident Evil Welcome to uh, um, uh, Raccoon City is is based on, so it was really exciting to to know that I was like, okay, I'm this will be familiar to me. And I was playing a character that existed in the in the first in the second game in the, of the first.
first two. But uh, yeah, no, I knew it was, I knew it was gonna be fun. It was I'd never done a genre film, and I knew the fans were gonna be really excited about it. And it's crazy, the international fans. There's a huge, you know, falling in South America for that game. So I've been talking to a lot of uh, Brazilian fans and Portuguese fans and stuff like that, and doing interviews down there. And the the amount of the knowledge they have is, and I'm also working on the. I, I have a few episodes of The Expanse out right now, and it's very similar to the fan bases. You know, they're the equivalent of, of Trekkies. They're asking me questions that I have no clue about, you know, and you got to kind of fake episode, it. Episode 42 in season, whatever. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're like with Resident Evil. They're like so because you know because it's a it's this type of infection you have, and so it affects your brain more than your body, and so you're still part human. I'm like, ah, I guess that's the kind of infection I had. All I know was that I was a zombie <laughs> after I you know once I got turned. But you know they're they're a really cool crowd, and it's and it's fun to 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 you know get swept up in their excitement. You know. Yeah, and, and so. It must have been really fun for you uh, to get involved in all the the uh, special effects makeup uh, for a zombie for the first time. Because I know most of us, when we were kids, we want to dress up as zombies at some point for Halloween or yeah. something like that. But it takes it to a whole new level when you get to work with professional, uh, you know, special effects makeup artists and things like that and get to make you look extra disgusting. Well, it's fun after the fact. The process is never fun. The worst part is doing the uh, the full head cast you have to do. So I had a prosthetic where half of my face was ripped off. And so in order to make just this chunk, they've got to do your whole head because they have to build this prosthetic that's going to go on your face on a, on a dummy version of your head. And that's the worst part because, you know, it's about an hour plus where you're, you know, you can't hear anything. You just got these two little holes for your nostrils and they're building this big, cast of your head and it gets sort of hard to breathe and can be very claustrophobic for a period of time you know and so there's that part and then there's the process of, of putting it on um which you know takes a couple hours but in all fairness you know my small prosthetic was nothing compared to some of the other the background uh, zombies or the, or the main featured monsters that would do in hours and hours of uh, prosthetics and you know i've done wounds and stuff like that before but seeing the final product when you have the contacts in with the blood and the lighting and and the attack that that's fun and to know that you know i get to exist in this horror movie you know there's already people doing cosplays of, of Dooley when he's zombified and uh and people talking about that scene it's, it's exciting to, to be to now live forever in that as a zombie in a zombie genre film you know so are you looking forward to the day where you get a call saying that you can be part of the toronto fan expo now and and uh, get to sign some autographs or something like that well you know it's funny i i did the fan expo years ago uh when i did Find gravity and uh i remember i uh it was interesting but yeah there's there's some talk about it now because uh the expanse as well as um as Resident Evil, and I do a video game character. I do a video game series called Far Cry. Um, I've been a part of all of them except for the most recent one, but we we might have some other things going on these days with them <clears throat> that I can't talk about. But uh, there's a character I do, Herc and Sharky, in the Far Cry series, and they've got a pretty good fan base as well. So when things start to open up again, it's definitely something that uh, I'll be speaking with my agent about about doing some convention stuff. And, uh, okay, so. So the last question is a twofold question. First, um, what can people expect from Dylan in terms of TV or film moving forward through 2022 that you can talk about right now? I know that you always have stuff in the works and, and things like that, like you said, with the Far Cry people and, and things like that. But is there anything that hasn't aired yet that you're looking forward to that you can talk about? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, just for starters, we've got the finale of uh, Station Eleven, which is available for streaming this Thursday on HBO Max or Crave if you're in Canada. And I've also in the finale of The Expanse, uh, which is the, se the series finale in this intonation, um, which will be available on Friday also, which is on Amazon. But um, I guess I might as well... Uh, I don't know, break it here or whatever. I'm, I'm uh, part of the new working mom season that uh, has just started. So um, look for the, the first episode just aired last week. It'll be the second episode airing this week. And uh, I might be showing up for the rest of the season in uh, the very near, near future as a, uh, as a new recurring character in working mom. So keep your eyes on for that. That's exciting. 
And last but certainly not least, we do this with every uh, guest the first time they come on the isolation series. Uh, do you have a couple of Spence moments or a couple of Spence memories uh, that you can share uh, with the listening and viewing audience? Because you and I have been friends for a long, long time. We've known each other a long time. It's one thing hearing uh, the friendship from my side. It's a whole other thing hearing it from the other person's perspective. So does anything stick out to you there? You know, I just, of course, my memories are always, are always around jazz festival and stuff like that. And just, uh, I, I can't, I don't know why we never got you a, a security guard shirt. You know, it was just, you were parked at every every entrance of that place at some point or other during the day, chatting up all, all our security guards and all, the, and all of our buddies and stuff that worked there. Or, I mean, and you know, you're the only guy that's backstage that doesn't have or require a backstage pass somehow, <laughs> you know? Maybe that's all the time you put in with the security guards, <laughs> you know? Or your dad. Or yeah. my dad, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, you know, just, it was just, you're always part of the, the, the camp, you know, the team, the, the memories of that, you know, there was always just, the festival was such a, a, a big part of, of our lives for, for so many years. And you were just, you know, part of the festival as far as we were all concerned. It was just somebody, you know, if you weren't there during the setup or opening day, it was like, when, when's Spence going to show up? <laughs> you know, where is he and stuff? So, you know, uh, my memories of that, of that time and I'm trying to think if I have any sort of one particular story, but uh, at, at the moment, not so much oh well one thing that i remember oh, you know what actually no i do have one and i've got to shout you out for this um you hooked my brother and i up with uh nick diaz versus gsp tickets in montreal back in well i was shooting copper at the time so i'd say 2012 was that when uh diaz fought gsp that is correct yeah and so you know i i, I gotta say that was that uh, was that was a big move that was a big pull i mean not many people i'd seen gsp fight you know, when he kicked it off in Toronto, uh, but I hadn't to see GSP fight in Montreal and then see him fight a guy like Nick Diaz, you know, you made that happen for more than I. So that's a nice Spence memory. But do you remember what the best fight on that card was? Uh, I, I do not, but I remember what the best moment of the whole experience of that night and hooking you guys up with was. And do you know what I'm going to talk about right now? Because you should remember this without having to think too hard, but I don't think it'll come to mind for you. Do you know what I'm going to talk about? Is it when I almost gave your buddy a smack? <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, no. Uh, I don't remember what it was. What was it? Uh, Morgan ripped his pants that oh. night. And so you guys sent me pictures from your seats with him doing the Carlton Banks tying his sweater around <laughs> his waist uh, to cover up the huge rip in his pants. That's funny. Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't remember that. I was too busy watching the Carlos Condit uh, uh, Johnny Hendricks fight. Yes. That, that was that was the fight. And uh, uh, no disrespect to your buddy or, or, or you had another friends there that were sitting next to us and they weren't, you know me, I'm a ravenous MMA fan. And, yeah. and and they were uh, they'd gone off and and drank for most of it and then came right back just at like the end of the third round of this Carlos Condit Johnny Hendricks fight and there's big implications on that fight and these two guys went to war and it's one of the main reasons they started adding five rounds to non-title fights because of that fight and like the the Shogun uh, Henderson fight too but I remember he just came in there and he was like you know, they were drunk and they were talking all this smack. Like, when's the main event going to And I was like, you guys got to shut up right now because this is a <laughs> major, major fight in it, you know, happening right now. And these two guys, you know, Carlos Condit, he's still one of my favorite fighters of all time. And I think one of the, you know, if it wasn't for GSP, that guy would have had a strap, a proper strap, just an interim. Right. I, I also think one of the memories that sticks out to me is uh, the time that I brought you and Morgan uh, the autograph baseball and bat uh over to you guys at that time too it was i think morgan got that i think morgan has that yeah i don't he, is it an alomar bat that he's got uh, it's an alomar bat and then i got a batista ball or something for okay. yeah yeah no, i don't think morgan ever showed me those i think morgan he kept those he kept those stashed away but he's more the collector than i am selfish uh and and last but certainly not least i always remember 
uh, you doing a graffiti thing every year uh, with a couple of your buddies uh, to raise some money for a good cause during the festival as well. Um, are you still in touch with those guys? Are they still doing the graffiti thing in some yeah, capacity? Yeah, those that was uh, the group of graffiti workshops that we did. We did them for thirteen years, which was great, and that was an outreach program we did through the jazz festival to uh, to uh, TDSB schools, and it was mostly for a lot of like youth at risk and stuff. Is who we tried to uh, tailor them towards. And the two artists that we had uh, were uh, Elixir and Media. Um, which is uh, Jabari Elliott and uh, Yvonne Blake, who are two of still the most visible graffiti artists in Toronto. You'll see elixirs and, and media stuff everywhere. Um, and those guys are, are still good buddies, but we stopped uh, doing the, the workshops, I think maybe about four or five years ago or so. Uh, the festival, you know, changed hands and uh, my dad retired and then the, the festival took on a whole new look. So it didn't quite have the, uh, the marquee, uh, it, didn't, it wasn't doing the, the big outdoor spaces and stuff like they used to do at, at City Hall and stuff. So when the festival changed, you know, but it, uh, Dragon, who was my partner in creating those, uh, we still, you know, uh, we'd like to, to kind of bring those workshops back in some capacity along the way. And I still speak with Jabari and, and Yvonne every once in a while about, you know, finding another way to do them. Because the cool thing is a lot of great uh, artists and visible artists that are in the city now came through that program. So, that's right. Well, um, and and how did you initially get connected with your partner in that in Dragon initially? Yeah, Dragon and I went to high school together, and we wrote graffiti in high school together. So he he uh, was a refugee from Croatia, and we met when we were about fourteen at, at Danforth Tech in the East End, and um, we started writing graffiti together. But he was always so afraid of getting deported uh he never actually like would would spray paint anything illegally whereas you know i would a little bit uh, you know and uh so what we did and when we were at danforth they had a 75th anniversary um celebration for the school so dragon and i put together a proposal to to spray paint a bunch of murals for the 75th anniversary to hang them all around the school and and they accepted a proposal and gave us a budget and stuff like that and that was sort of our inspiration for group and graffiti workshops when we finished high school and went to post-secondary and I think we we're about a year at a post-secondary so maybe four years removed from high school we thought oh it'd be cool to to kind of teach kids to do what we just had to figure out on our own you know this amazing medium and we had to you know experiment illegally somewhat to learn this medium and we were like this they should be teaching this in the schools kids are excited about it they love it I mean we teach you know pastels and oils and everything else in our class you know they should be learning aerosol art so that was dragging our, you know, our experience as kids really is what inspired us to, to do those workshops initially. Yeah, and, and it was nice to see that medium come to the forefront a couple of years ago in the animated movie Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah. You had never seen graffiti really highlighted uh, like that in, in a movie until that point. So it was really nice to see that, I thought. And they did a, there was a, cool, a great show called The Get Down which was uh, on, on Netflix a few years ago, which was a, a show sort of about the origins of hip hop. And it was a beautifully- uh, with, with, with Jaden Smith. Yeah, yeah, he had a, he had a, he had a, he had a small part in it. He wasn't one of the leads, but he, he, was, he had a, a good little part in it. But um, uh, they did an amazing job of, of bringing graffiti to, you know, to life in that and having it moving and stuff in, the same, in a similar way that the Spider-Verse did that, that shows that this is this, you know, graffiti has a real pulse to it and a real meaning behind it it's important and it makes people feel uh heard and present and you know and important you know uh, putting your name up on a big ass wall and and having people walk by and look at it and know your name sometimes you know that's that's more than enough to get you through some hard days absolutely well this has been an absolutely fantastic addition of the isolation series on this Tuesday. Dylan, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me today. And I look forward to having you on in the not too distant future to talk more about working moms and Far Cry and all the other stuff you got going on that you can't really talk about right now, my friend. Thanks, Spence, man. Always a pleasure, dude. And uh, I got one last question for you. In Ghana or Gain? Uh, say again? In Ghana or Gain? Gain. 100% gain. 
uh, Cyril Gain is on quite the roll. And even though Francis is Francis, I believe that Cyril uh, can shock a lot of people, kind of like Juliana Pena did versus uh, the lioness Amanda Nunes, which, by the way, um, you know, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but I think that Amanda Nunes was checked out in that fight or something, thinking about something else, because if you look at the replay, the choke that Juliana had on her wasn't even really sunk in before she started tapping out. So I believe that if they roll that back in the not too distant future and Nunez is Nunez, the way that we've seen her be on multiple occasions, no disrespect to Juliana Pena, but she gets crushed. No, no disrespect to Pena at all, but I mean, that had, uh, you know, a bit of the GSP Matt Sarah vibe to it at times where you were like, I think this person thought they were just going to walk through the park and they didn't realize that they had a very capable fighter in front of them, you know, or didn't respect them enough. But I, 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 I think Gain has all the tools. I think he's the more dynamic uh, striker and I think he's got the better ground game. But I think the sport needs Ngano to win. I think that fighter pay, you know, with all the, you know, weather's taken the nonsense of Jake Paul to really bring it to, to light in such a major way. I think Ngannou, I think we need to, for him to win that fight in order, you know, for fighters pay to come up because his last fight on his contract, if he loses the game, I think he's done with the UFC. And uh, if he wins though, they got to pay their champ. Um, do, do you, do you believe that, um, the Jake Paul situation is becoming more and more uh, serious to somebody like uh, Dana White because, yes, he hasn't really fought too many people of merit, and that's why people were excited to see him take on Tommy Fury, but then Tommy Fury got sick and everything like that. But all of that aside, Jake Paul and his brother Logan are a money-making machine right now, whether you want to watch their sideshow or not. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I think it's something that, you know, is interesting. Um, if he wants to come in, if you, I, you know, I, I compete as an amateur boxer and uh, I've been boxing for a long time. And uh, it's, two, it's two ways right now. You know, you, you've either got to box a boxer. I mean, you've got to box a boxer. Tommy Fury was the perfect fight for him, you know, I, and, or for uh, both of them, you know, I hope that fight happens. They have similar records. There's close in age. And if he wants to be a boxer, box a boxer, the MMA stuff was fun, but clearly the kid has hands. He's got power. He's an athlete, box a boxer or fight MMA. You know what I mean? I, I like, you know, I think his newest deal out there was, but fight an MMA in your weight class, you know I mean? So he's, he's calling out Jorge Masvidal, who, you know, on a big day is 170, but he was a lightweight for a lot of years, you know, and Jake Paul's, you know, 190. I mean, he's a middleweight, you know, he, uh, he, sure, he could cut down to, he could cut down to welter weight, but if he wants to do that, if he wants to, I think Dana White should give him a, a one fight MMA contract if he wants it, you know, welter weight or middleweight, and he fights legit welterweight or middleweight. I like to see him fight Paul Costa. Yeah, but if that's the case, I get, uh, I get, like flashbacks of when James Tony wanted to come in. And yeah, but Jake Paul, was, Jake Paul was a wrestler. Jake Paul was like a division. He was like a state wrestler. He was a state champion. I think they both were in Ohio or something, the, the Paul brothers. So it's not like James Tony who just come in and got like, you know, Randy just like he'll pick them. And, like, you know, <laughs> and he had a zero answer for it, you know. Plus he was old. He was out of shape. You know, he was past his prime. I think it's much different look for Jake Paul to go in there who's young, athletic, has a wrestling background. But you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's like Michael Jordan, you know, challenging, you know, uh, some other great, you know, uh, it's like, you know, it's they're different sports is all I'm saying. You know, taking a great in one sport and challenging a great in another uh, sport. My, Michael Jordan taking on Ken Griffey Jr. back Exactly, in you know what I mean? That's exactly what it would have been, you know, except for, and, you know, or Ken Griffey Jr. challenging Michael Jordan, really, because Michael Jordan had some baseball skills that we all were aware of, but he wasn't on that level. Jake Paul has some boxing skills, but, you know, maybe not on that level. I mean, I don't, I don't know. But uh, it's just, I'm done. I'm done with it now as far as, you know, 
if you're going to be a boxer, box boxers, stop boxing, you know, retired. MMA retired MMA. MMA. Yes. Or, yeah. or, 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 or Nate Robinson for that matter. That was I mean, that was, that was, I mean, that was, that was early days, you know, the Ben Askren one was a joke. I mean, Ben Askren, whatever. I mean, you know, Ben's Ben, so he's going to do what he's going to do. But I mean, he looked just awful. Like, I mean, he was, you know, so out of shape going into that, coming off hip surgery and the whole nine. The Woodley situation was just ugly. And it's, I feel bad for Woodley. And, uh, but, you know, he got a desperately needed, two desperately needed paydays. And, uh, but yeah, his legacy's tarnished forever. He's always the guy that Jake Paul, you know. Speaking, uh, speaking of legacies being tarnished, uh, do you think that we will ever see John Jones make his debut at heavyweight? Because that's a guy who, if he could get out of his own way and stop having yes men around him for as long as he did, um, like he would have gone down uh, unquestionably in my mind as the best overall MMA fighter of all time. He was on that trajectory and pretty much nobody could stop him other than Vitor Belfort with that uh, arm lock almost snapping his arm back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. ACC. Yes, uh, but but it's very sad about the John Jones situation. So what do you think is going to happen over the next, uh, you know, uh, several months with the John Jones situation? Uh, because even though I'm still excited to see him perform in the octagon especially at heavyweight to see if he can stand up to some of those heavyweights uh part of me always has in the back of my mind now even if we do watch him are we going to be told tomorrow or the next day that he was on some type of performance enhancing drug yeah i agree that's always you know a concern and been just i you know i've been a bones fan like i mean since that the spinning elbow on, on stefan bonner you know that was his kind of big coming out party you know after a couple great you know outings but uh, uh i think honestly if you look at the history of heavyweights they peak later i think jones has a huge part of his career still ahead of him i think he'll figure it out uh i don't know the science behind you know the the steroids being locked in his system forever or whatever it is you know but uh uh, you know, what's Bones? He's like 30 now? Uh, he's 34. 30, oh, he's that old. Okay. I thought he was a bit younger than that still. No. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, you look at guys like Randy Couture and 42 and stuff like that, and Bones has taken not a ton of damage. He's had some big fights where he's gotten lit up, but he's also had big breaks in his career. You know, he's not been a guy like, you know, that went three times a year for multiple years, you know. Uh, I think he has a big comeback. I think he'll be a heavyweight champion. I think he'll he'll have a... I think he'll put together a, a good year or two in the near future. I don't know if it's going to be 2022. If I had to guess, I'd say 2023 and 2024 are big years for him, maybe even further down the road. Yeah, but isn't it sad, though, that uh, – and, and sad is not the right word, but it's the only word I can think of. Uh, like, he was making, you know, almost – uh, Connor McGregor level type money. Remember when he had the Nike swoosh? When he had Nike sponsorship coming into the ring, that was huge. He was what Dana was trying to make him LeBron. You know. Yes. Yes. And it's sad that yeah that he got in his own way. But I mean, the history is full of people that have gotten their own way and and have not been had the opportunities to recover, which is something I think we're all growing frustrated with. You're going, you know, how many chances is this guy going to get? But you know, are you are you as happy as I am that we, we've seen? sort of the resurrection of Mike Tyson in terms of being able to put his life back together because he literally lost everything, dealt with drugs, dealt with the same things uh, on a bigger scale that John Jones is essentially dealing with. And now he seems to be in a good place. And we saw in that Triller exhibition that when he starts training again, uh, you know, he can get back into great shape. He was in phenomenal shape. Uh, and, um, you know, when they put up that video of him hitting pads, preparing for uh, that exhibition fight, he can still hit with power. Oh, yeah, that, that clip just about broke the internet. I mean, uh, it's exciting to see. I think he's a testament to um, mental health, you know, to the ability to recover from him. The guy was clearly very, you know, mentally unwell for a lot of years, you know, through a uh, trauma as a youth and then 
through you know uh, the, you know his life as as a heavyweight champion, whether it was you know losing uh, Cus D'Amato, his his, uh, his trainer and father figure, and then being you know taken advantage of arguably by by promoters and yes men, and then not being well mentally. I think to for people, young people that are angry and aggressive and have had those kind of trauma to now see, you know, the kind of man he's is now and his honesty and his, his emotions being so far on the surface, I think it sort of speaks to uh, where we are, uh, you know, as people and in the advancement of say, for, for males, you know, uh, for people to see a guy like Mike Tyson, who was all these things, you know, who was this, this killer and this champ and this aggressive guy and this star and this womanizer and blah, blah, blah. And to see him just sort of be, you know, an emotionally available, open person. I think it's, uh, it's, you know, I think it's, it's something good for, for young men to, to look at and think a lot about. Well, like I said, 20 minutes ago, my friend, it seems yeah. uh, absolutely great to have you on for the first time on the isolation series. Uh, and I look forward to having you on again soon, like I said, to talk about uh, more of Working Moms and Far Cry and all the rest of the stuff that you can't talk about right now. And more specifically about me sending you a big box of Kleenex to wipe up your crocodile tears after seeing Engano get killed by Ciro and, and everything like that. But thank you so much again for joining us here on this Tuesday edition of the Isolation Series. See what happens Saturday night's events. Absolutely. For <laughs> Dylan Taylor and Paul Shields, I am Spencer Miller. This has been the Isolation Series, and we'll see you all again tomorrow. Bye bye. Thanks, fellas. And Paul, please tell people all about some more whole grain goodness that is us. Folks, be sure to check us out on podbean.com by going to the isolation series.podbean.com. There you'll find the audio-only versions of the podcast, including all of our past amazing interviews. One more time, that's the isolationseries.podbean.com. And hey, don't forget to follow us on Instagram. It's at the Spencer Miller and at Polly Shields. Polly spelled P-A-W-L-Y. So find us on podbean.com, follow us on Instagram, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And once again, everybody, thank you for watching and or listening and supporting this thing we like to call the Isolation Series. For Paul Shields, I am Spencer Miller, and we will see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye.